There's an amazing verse in Deuteronomy um, that I'd like to start out with. Do you recall the background for the book of Deuteronomy? Does anybody remember the background for the book of Deuteronomy? <laughs> okay. Just before they went into the one, one of each. One of each. Yeah, one with William Miller, one with Joseph Bates. Yeah. All right. Here, my friend. Just before they went into the land of, of Israel, just before they crossed the Jordan, and God is telling them that they need to know their past. They need to review the history. And the verse I'm thinking of is in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Um, again, how many people are alive at this point that were alive when they came through the Red Sea? And do we understand that some children were? Mm -hmm. My understanding is that they, everybody above a certain age oh, yeah. died. Okay? But again, how much the children remember from 40 years before, you know, it's, it's a little bit questionable. Um, so Moses is told to sit the people down and review what God has done the last 40 plus years. Um, because they had not been there at the beginning. Many of them have been born in the wilderness, right? Have you ever pictured yourself as one of the persons, one of the people, one of the individuals born in the wilderness? Have you ever tried to picture yourself as that? I think it's useful to imagine things like that. That's, that's using your imagination for what God gave it to you for. And that is to, to visualize past, real past events. Don't, don't waste it on fiction. Use it on real past events and realities that exist now that we can't see. Yes. I had to tell a children's story one time. Mm -hmm. and that was kind of the theme. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it. And you know how teenagers get tired of their clothes when their clothes lasted for a long, long time. And the kids didn't have very many toys. And I was thinking, you know, they might take somebody else's. And mm -hmm. it was quite a... I mean, Experiment in, ima in imagination, house. right. Um, but again, if you were born there, you would, you know, the, your first memories would be camping in the desert, right? <laughs> and you would think, at some point, is this life? I mean, this is what everyone does? And they would say, oh, no, we haven't lived here forever. We're actually going somewhere. You know, how long is it going to take? <laughs> That's what kids usually ask, right? When are we going to get there? Yeah, are we there yet? Um, so, again, put yourself in their shoes, and you need to be told something that you don't remember. You weren't even there, perhaps, when it happened. So this is an amazing, this is why the, the, the book includes a second recounting of the, of the Ten Commandments. Because Moses is recounting what happened on Mount Sinai, in chapter, chapter 5, that is. But I'm in, I'm in chapter 4, and I wanted to look particularly at verse 9. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 4 9, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. That's the vital importance of passing on identity. Identity is bound up in history. We know who we are based on our past. And this is what Moses is doing here. Um, the Jewish people, by and large, have done quite a bit of work doing this. If you go to a Passover today, they say, we at one time were slaves in Egypt. 
Um, you know, they weren't alive then, but it's a corporate identity. Um, one other thing that I might touch on briefly here before, before I leave. There was a verse that the Advent believers um, used quite a bit from the book of Habakkuk. Uh, I'm not talking about the Reformation watchword, which is also from Habakkuk, right? Habakkuk 2, verse 4. What is that one? The just shall live by faith. Um, the, the Adventists looked at the previous verses. Okay, In, in Habakkuk 2, um, they saw verses 2 and 3 applying to them, particularly at a certain point in Adventist history. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And the implication is forever. Okay? That, that verb, make it plain on tablets, occurs only two other times in the whole Old Testament. He, and when you find a, a verb that's, that's that rare, there's usually some significant ties, okay? Both of their times are in the book of Deuteronomy. And the first one is at the very beginning of the book, if I can remember the verse here. Um, chapter 1. And um, I believe it was verse 9. God had started talking to them in verse 6. Notice that? Deuteronomy 1, 6. You have dwelt long enough in this mountain. <laughs> Turn and take your journey. Um, and I believe... Let's see here. What, what verse was it that, where God told him to... Oh no, it's verse 5. It's verse 5. On this side of Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses began, what does it say in your versions? To declare this law. To declare this law. My version here says to, to explain this law. It's the same verb. To make it plain. Deuteronomy 1 and verse 5. Began to explain this law, saying. Very same verb, this from Habakkuk. The other place is toward the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, I think it's chapter 27. Yes. Do you remember this part of the story? Um, God said in this story in the book of Deuteronomy, when you cross Jordan, you will set up for yourselves, this is verse 2, large stones and you will whitewash them with lime. So you're getting the picture of a, a wall of stones that are whitewashed, okay? And you shall write on them all the words of this law. They didn't have printing presses. They didn't pass out copies of the law. What did they do? Write it on. Made a wall and wrote it on the wall. And it's verse 8 and you shall write very plainly on the stones all the words of this law. That's the other use of the verb. You shall write it plainly. So what is God wanting the plain writing to convey? The law. The law. Which, all the words of this law is not just what he spoke from Sinai, right? What was it? It was a story. It included what he spoke from Sinai, but it, it was the story of, of their past. Write it, write it down there. And maybe it's the word Torah in the Hebrew, probably, which could be the first five books, you know. And I thought, what, what did that wall look like? How many people went there? You know, how often did they go there and read that? How often did they take their kids to the wall? Yeah, to have all the words of the book. Even if it was the book of Deuteronomy, it would be a big size wall. Right, right. Right. 
Duke, hand me that, that small black bag that's behind the other thing there. I wanted a small black bag behind the other ones. It's a satchel behind the other one. Maybe it's inside there. No, it's right there. Is that one there? This one? Yeah. Um, we have a lot of things that are written today, right? We're, over, we're overwhelmed with things that are written. Um, we don't have the problem that they had back then of having a hard time getting things in writing. There are some parts in the world that do. They're starved for writing. In fact, you've probably heard the story, Light Bearers Ministry that publishes millions of pieces of literature and ships them free to third world countries. They've been told that there's areas in Africa the literacy rate has gone up because they have something to read. Amen. And what are they reading? They're reading the message. You know that uh, these guys are printing in Oregon and Washington. Anyway, what I wanted to just highlight was this thing here. This is an amazing wall, if you please, right? This is a wall. And uh, there's how many you know, thousands and thousands of pages on here of, of uh, writings about our history. And a lot of what I'm sharing with you this evening uh, came out of that. Um, on the, that's the CD-ROM. Uh, Ellen White's complete collection in the, in the uh, yeah. This one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so what, what, we, what we decided to do, and we're doing this because um, this gentleman here is not going to be in the States a whole lot, lot more months. And what we thought we would do, the, the big sheet I gave you, the 11 by 17 overview of the 28 pioneers, we thought we'd just spend some time going through those pioneers, yeah. reviewing their lives, okay? And um, we hope to finish it before we have to leave in June. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's what we'll pl plan on doing. Not every Sunday will I be here between now and then, but most of them, it looks like at this point, I will. So what I'd like to do is start out with the, the first two on those timelines, which are the handouts that I gave you. Um, yes. Um, right. This is actually available on the web in PDF form. Um, if you go to the aplib.org website, you will find a link for this. I believe there's a link on the home page as well as on the periodical page. Obviously, to print it this size, you need a tabloid printer, 11 by 17. But if you do, if you do print it on one of these size pieces of paper, it, it will print, but it will be shrunk down, which is good for young eyes, but not old eyes. And there, there's 28, I mean, sorry, 27 pioneers here. And we're going to look at the first two. These are just arranged chronologically, if you can see. The oldest ones are at the top. And then the younger ones come down here. And the lifespans are given on the timeline as to when they lived. A little bit about them. And then the actual issues. We've done periodical issues in the past on these people. And, for instance, here, here's the one on William Miller. This is what the cover of that looks like. It's called Lest We Forget. And this is volume one, number two. Volume one, number one was an introduction where we had the first edition of this timeline. Not, not as complete as this uh, version is. But the very first uh, biographical overview is the one on William Miller. Yes, she was the first one that drafted it, I think, with the help of Marlene Steinwood edited it. She was an editor for Of Lest We Forget, and then I did some more editing later on. So you can see um, through the years it's, it's been there. Um, Okay, so let's, let's begin looking at the highlights of William Miller's life. Uh, you probably know something about him, but maybe not all the details. And what I did, actually, um, the table, the, the, the rows are events in his life, giving you when they happened and the age that he was. But I've extracted um, from the CD-ROM paragraphs from his memoirs. And that's what the... Uh, the code, uh, SB, is Sylvester Bliss. He's the author who published the memoirs of William Miller. MWM is Memoirs of William Miller. And this was published, as you can see, in 1853, which will be part of uh, a point on the timeline here if, if uh, you want to. By the way, on each of these periodical issues, we have timelines on the pioneers that sort of 
give what we're giving in a table form, but more on a timeline form as well as, as a written form. So you can see when he was born, born in 1782, 16 years after the Declaration of Independence, right? Gives you this setting. 16 years also before what event? The end of the 1260 year prophecy, 1798. And so during his growing up years were the, these amazing events of the birth of a nation, the French Revolution, um, Napoleon, and Berthier taking the Pope captive. And um, at the age of 21, in 1803, he married a lady by the name of Lucy Smith. And he fought in the War of 1812 which was between the, the uh, colonies, or the, the, the nation at that time, I should say, and the British. Okay? We'd already fought the Revolutionary War. And they burned the, the, the White House and several other... Yeah, right. There was, there was some major uh, impact from that war. And he was, you can see, he was, he was a, a grown man, 30 years old at that time. His life was, he felt, at the, after the war, was miraculously spared during... The, the war, because he saw people dying around him. And so you come out of that type of an experience saying, why did they die and I didn't? You know, whenever you're delivered from death and people around you have died, that's often the, the, the thing that you consider. And so up to that point, he had been a deist. Uh, deists are people who do believe that there is a God. Obviously, the name implies that but that he uh, is an absentee landlord, as it were. He got things going and then he left, and you know, he's not really a personal God, not intimately involved with his creation. Um, but that was challenged in his experience in the war. And it was also challenged, uh, you know, it, it took some years of, of processing. You can see here from the, from the record. Two, four years later, 1816, he has the experience, it, in which it was uh, described as his conversion experience. And probably better than anything else is just to describe the, uh, the description or read the description of it here from his memoirs because it's, uh, it's very significant how, how it's gone through. On the Lord's Day following, uh, we're jumping to the middle of the story obviously, here. it devolved upon Captain Miller because he was called that from the war as usual in the minister's absence, to read a discourse of the deacon's selection. By the way, the story was that um, he didn't attend church regularly, and his mother rebuked him for it, and um, he said something to the effect that he didn't care for the, the way the readings were done. And so what did his mother do? She arranged with the deacons for him to be asked to do the reading. And so he was there every time. He was to read the discourse of the Deacon Selection. They had chosen one on the importance of parental duties. Soon after commencing, he was overpowered by an inward struggle of emotion with which the entire congregation deeply sympathized and took his seat. What does that, what does that tell you? Was he able to finish? No. He, he, he was so emotionally uh, worked up or touched, <laughs> as we would say, that he had to sit down. And, and the people sympathized with him. His deistical principles seemed an almost insurmountable difficulty with him. Soon after, suddenly, he says, the character of a savior was vividly impressed upon my mind. It seemed that there might be a being so good and compassionate as to himself atone for our transgressions and thereby save us from suffering the penalty of sin. I immediately felt how lovely such a being must be and imagined that I could cast myself into the arms of and trust in the mercy of such an one. But the question arose, how can it be proved that such a being does exist? Aside from the Bible, I found that I could get no evidence of the existence of such a Savior, or even of a future state. I felt that to believe in such a Savior without evidence would be visionary in the extreme. 
I saw that the Bible did bring to view just such a Savior as I needed. And I was perplexed to find how an uninspired book, which the deist looked at the Bible as, how an uninspired book should develop principles so perfectly adapted to the wants of a fallen world. I was constrained to admit that the scriptures must be a revelation from God. They became my delight, and in Jesus I found a friend. The Savior became to me the chiefest among 10,000. And the scriptures, which before were dark and contradictory, now became a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. My mind became settled and satisfied. I found the Lord God to be a rock in the midst of the ocean of life. The Bible now became my chief study, and I can truly say I searched it with great delight. I found the half was never told me. I wondered why I had not seen its beauty and glory before and marveled that I could ever have ever rejected it. I found everything revealed that my heart could desire and a remedy for every disease of the soul. I lost all taste for other reading and applied my heart to get wisdom from God. Can you see the moving of the Spirit right. that the Advent movement was, was, was born into? Was so this was not a crusty old hardened man, but a man who, you know, in his searching found God. Or God found him, we probably should say. <laughs> He's 34 years old. 34 years old, 1816. Okay. Long before James and Ellen were even born. <laughs> um, he's... He's finding the Lord. I never read this before. You didn't. Well, again, I, what I'm going to do with this is telling you, you know, there's a wealth of, of amazing stuff on here. This is just an extract of one paragraph. It's all on here. The entire memoir is here. You can read the whole thing. What you can, but you, is this it's Sylvester Bliss is the author. I mentioned it before, but I'll go over it again. SB is, is the author, Sylvester Bliss. SS Bliss. MWM is the book code, Memoirs of William Miller. So that's the, we, we use these book codes to, they're at the end of every paragraph, if you, as you notice here. And it gives you the page number and the paragraph number as well. So we have an interval then of some 15 years. And I'd like just to, to notice some things, uh, note some things out of, the, out of our periodical here. Um, when challenged by his deist friends to prove that the Bible was the word of God, this is an article that was, we wrote on William Miller, and actually Dr. Ray Foster did this one. Um, when challenged by his deist friends to prove the Bible was the Word of God, Miller decided on two, two criteria. Number one, if the Bible was the Word of God, it must be understandable from the obvious meaning of the language used. Where are you reading this? I'm not reading that from there. I'm reading it from the article. Okay. Uh, again, these, these things are or will be online. This, this issue is online, which you can go and access. So these are the th criteria that William Miller used. The Bible is understandable in the language in which it was written, obviously translated for us. Um, number two, if the Bible were the Word of God, it had to be consistent within itself. For two years, he studied to satisfy himself concerning those two points. Okay? It's understandable. If you let it interpret itself in the way it's written, and you take it literally, unless it's obviously symbolic, <laughs> um, and you find consistency within itself. He had no aids but his crudence concordance in comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's all he was doing. He was perfectly satisfied that he could understand the Scriptures. If the Bible meant what it said and said what it meant, and the Bible was consistent. In the process of that study, he came across the prophecies of Daniel and was introduced to the, the, the thought the, that he obviously ran with that the longest time prophecy there in Daniel 8 would come to its end in his lifetime. Can you imagine beginning to dawn on him? The time in which you live. First of all, first of all he finds out there is a God. This is his word. And then he starts just diving into it. And then he finds out when, he, when he's living, you know, the times in which he's living. 
So from 1816 to 1831, he farmed to support his family and he continued studying. Okay? We come then to 1831. 15 years later, he's been studying and working and studying and working and raising his family as we you know, do the normal things of life. And then we come to this account that is recorded for us from the year 1831. He is now 49 years old. Okay? Well past uh, midlife. We could say it from that perspective in that, in that era. Um, past the midpoint for most of us even now, life expectancy is usually less than 98. <laughs> so let me just read these paragraphs here. The public labors of Mr. Miller, according to the best evidence to be obtained, date from the autumn of 1831. Uh, he had continued to be much distressed respecting his duty to go and tell it to the world. This, was, this had, was something that had been impressed upon his mind sometime earlier. And he's much distressed about it, right? Which was constantly impressed upon his mind. One Saturday after breakfast, he sat down at his desk to examine some point, And as he arose to go out to work, it came home to him with much more force than ever. Go and tell it to the world. He thus writes, The impression was so sudden and came with such force that I settled down into my chair saying, I can't go, Lord. Why not, seemed to be the response. And then all my excuses came up, my want of ability, etc. But my distress became so great. In other words, the Holy Spirit didn't back off. <laughs> Just kept pushing it. When the distress came so great, I entered into a solemn covenant with God that if He would open the way, I would go and perform my duty to the world. What do you mean by opening the way? It seemed to come to me. The <laughs> Lord's talking with him, conversing, you know, probing him. Why, said I, if I should have an invitation to speak publicly in any place, I will go and tell them what I find in the Bible about the Lord's coming. Instantly all my burden was gone. And I rejoice that I should not probably be thus called upon. <laughs> For I had never had such an invitation. <laughs> right. My trials were not known. But he hadn't been telling anybody about this burden that he'd been distressed about and struggling with. He, he kept it secret because he didn't want anybody to get ideas, perhaps. And I had but little expectation of being invited to any labor, field of labor. In about half an hour from this time, before I had left the room, a son of Mr. Guilford of Dresden, about 16 miles from my residence, came in and said that his father had sent for me and wished me to go home with him. Supposing that he wished, me, uh, wished to see me on some business, I asked him what he wanted. He replied that there was, there, there was to be no preaching in their church the next day, and his father wished to have me come and talk to the people on the subject of the Lord's coming. <laughs> I was immediately angry with myself. For having made the covenant I had, I rebelled at once against the Lord and determined not to go. I left the boy without giving him any answer and retired in great distress to a grove nearby, a grove of trees. There I struggled with the Lord for about an hour, endeavoring to release myself from the covenant I had made with him. But I could get no relief. It was impressed upon my conscience. Will you make a covenant with God and break it so soon? And the exceeding sinfulness of thus doing overwhelmed me. I finally submitted and promised the Lord that if He would sustain me, I would go, trusting in Him to give me grace and ability to perform all He should require of me. I returned to the house and found the boy still waiting. He remained till after dinner and I returned with him to Dresden. The next day, which as nearly as I can remember, was about the first Sabbath in August, 1833, I delivered my first public lecture on the Second Advent. The house was well filled with an attentive audience. As soon as I commenced speaking, all my diffidence and embarrassment were gone, and I felt impressed only with the greatness of the subject, which by the providence of God I was enabled to present. 
at the close of the services on the Sabbath, this of course was the Sabbath of the first day keepers, I was requested to remain and lecture during the week with which I complied. They flocked in from the neighboring towns. A revival commenced. And it was said that in 13 families, all but two persons were hopefully converted. You got to watch what you ask God for. It gives you more than you ever imagined. Yeah. So you can see, again, a man who's met God, who's, 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 who's left all the writings of men that are not inspired and just gone to the scripture, 15 years, buried himself in it. And the Lord by, finally says, okay, it's about time. <laughs> you tell somebody what you found. And he, he says, no, 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 not me, not me. And it's like, I don't give things to people just to keep. Right? Right. I don't understand the contradiction, but... He struggled for two years with that impression to go to school. Well, it says the public labors date from the autumn of 1831. And then here says the first... Well, first, license right. to preach. Yeah, license right. to preach. It takes time like, for you to get a credential. But she's referring to the paragraph I just read, which says the first Sabbath in August of 33. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Now, I need to check that because I notice after the 33, there's a number one there after the comma, which doesn't, doesn't fit. It may be actually 31. <laughs> so we'll, we'll check that, okay? Yeah, that's the way it is on the CD-ROM. And again, if you're using the CD-ROM and you find mistakes, typos or things that didn't make sense, let us know because it's not perfect and we want feedback because we're correcting it for the next edition at some point uh, if time lasts. But you, again, you can see a man who... Once he finally says yes to the Lord and he goes and, goes and does what he was impressed to do, even though he didn't feel capable of doing it, he does it. And the Lord empowers him, not just with the ability to do it with a passion, because he's convinced the subject is important, but with the indictment of the Holy Spirit, because people are converted. There's a revival that breaks out. And do you think God wants this to happen again? everywhere around the world by people who understand Scripture and have been listening, listening to the Word of God? He was a very humble man. Yes, he was. He said sometimes he would stop his preaching and go down and take some elderly person by the arm and find him a seat and put him down and he'd go back up and resume right where he left off. Yeah, whether or not the recording picked it up, let me repeat it. She said he was a humble man who, as he was lecturing, would see an older person come in and needed help and he would go down and help them find a seat and then go back up to continue his lecture. So he was very sensitive, it sounds like, uh, to the needs of others. And obviously that's what the Holy Spirit uh, makes us as well as we let him. So that's the picture that we have of, of, of him beginning his labors. Um, by 1833, he is given a license by his local Baptist church. They obviously see the evidence of the Spirit using this man. And so they say, here's a license to preach. <laughs> uh, it's not somebody who's trained in a theological institution, but someone who obviously God has trained and is taking off the farm. And we're told God will repeat this. He'll take the common person and use them in ways that the educated people who have gotten big heads cannot be used. He's doing it. If we look around, we'll see it. It's very, very clearly happening. In 1840, uh, going on to the next... Um, point in the timeline that we want to consider. He's, he's 58 years old now, seven years later. Obviously, he's been traveling around, responding to invitations. And the article here does say um, that the invitation to speak usually came from ministers of congregations. He had determined not to speak except by invitation. Before long, there were so many invitations that he could not fill half of them. So as the word spread... And, and though, and though, he was still sticking specifically to his covenant. Yes. If I'm asked, if I'm asked, if I'm asked to speak. That's right. He financed his ministry from his own purse and became, got into some financial difficulty because of that. Um, 
and he and his farm and his family were told suffered financially during that period of his life. By 1840, now or seven years later, he's 58 years old, there is a group of ministers and he's signed as the head of this group of ministers, being considered now a minister even though uh, off the farm, that call for a general conference on the second coming of Jesus to be held in Boston. And that was held in October of that year, October 14 and 15, and the entire record is on the CD-ROM. It's published, and it's called, as I says here, the first report of the General Conference of Christians expecting the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, Miller was not able to make it because he had an attack of typhoid fever just after he left home and was carried back home on a stretcher. <laughs> and, of course, in those days, sometimes that was fatal because they didn't have good treatments for the typhoid then. But those who did make it, there are their names. You may recognize some, you may not. Joshua V. Himes, Henry Dana Ward, Henry Jones, Josiah Litch, and Joseph Bates. Hmm. Joseph Bates. Involved with that first advent, first conference, first general conference of Christians expecting the advent. Um, I don't mention it here, but... During these years, there was a huge explosion of publications by people writing on this topic. Periodicals jump popping up all over the place. You can look in the library. There's a book called The History of Adventism, I believe is the name of it, by Edwin Gostad, the retired professor from UCR, who's an expert on Adventist history. Not a Seventh-day Adventist, but that's been his, apparently his field of study, and I think it was his doctoral area too. His appendices in the book list page after page after page of Advent periodicals being published in this town and in this town and this town. It's amazing. Now that's, they didn't have internet, they didn't have television, they didn't have radio. They just published and published and mailed things and, you know, that's the way they communicated. Letters and... One for women. One for women. I wasn't aware of that one. Women Millerites. Uh, put out in May of 1844. They had three, three issues. Interesting. Three issues in May of 44. The first one was May 1844. Mm -hmm. There were just three issues, and there were many, many pages. Wow. Was it a monthly, like May, June, and July, or no. just? No. Really? I think there was maybe one after October 22. Okay. Right okay. I was surprised. I didn't realize there was one. For yeah. One yeah that's, I mean, at some point, that list needs to be computerized and put on the web just for people to see how much was done. It's in, it's in a copyrighted book, so we'd have to get permission for that, but it'd be very interesting to do. Miller, in looking at the date that would be the fulfillment of Daniel 8.14, did not specific, pick a specific day. He picked a year. And the year was the Jewish year that began in 43 and extended to 44. And the Jewish year goes from spring to spring, if you recall. That's why Passover is always, which is the beginning of the Jewish, it's actually the second week of the beginning of the Jewish year. <laughs> Full moon starts the year. Uh, it's always in the springtime, if you recall, when, when Passover comes even now. Because again, it's tied to, as we've said before, what? Barley harvest. And barley is a dry land crop which in Palestine grows during the wet season, which like here in California is the, 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 what we have in the winter months, winter months in the northern hemisphere. Um, basically, you know, rains, we're in them right now. Rains start in, the, in November, October, and they go through the April, March time of year, and then so the barley's growing, and then it gets ripe there in the springtime. And that's when they began uh, their year because they had to have a, the barley wave sheaf to present to the Lord what was the day after pa Passover, was it not? I believe that's when it was. And Passover always was on the 14th day of that month. The first day of the month was, was new moon. So Passover was always on full moon. And that's when their year began. So they were expecting this sometime between this year, March 21 of 43 and March 21 of 44. That time came and went. And that is often referred to as the first disappointment. On the 2nd of May, some, what 
would you say, six weeks later, something like that, he writes a letter to Second Advent believers. And this is, these are extracts from that letter. Were I to live my life over again with the same evidence that I had then, to be honest with God and man, I should have, done, I should have to do as I have done. Although opposers said it would not come, they produced no weighty arguments. It was evidently guesswork with them. And I then thought and do now that their denial was based more on an unwillingness for the Lord to come than on any argument leading to such a conclusion. They didn't want him to come, right? Mm -hmm. I confess my error and acknowledge my disappointment, yet I still believe that the day of the Lord is near, even at the door. And I exhort you, my brethren, to be watchful and not let that day come upon you unawares. The wicked, the proud, and the bigot will exult over us. I will try to be patient. God will deliver the godly out of temptation and will reserve the unjust to be punished at Christ's appearing. I want you, my brethren, not to be drawn away from the truth. Do not, I pray, you neglect the scriptures. They are able to make you wise unto eternal life. Let us be careful not to be drawn away from the manner and object of Christ's coming. For the next attach of the attack that should be of the adversary will be to induce unbelief respecting these. The manner of Christ's coming has been well discussed. Permit me then to address you on the subject of, and then he went on to another topic. Another heading in that section of his memoirs. Can you read that last sentence over one more time? I want to see the manner of Christ coming has been well discussed. That was not the last sentence. And then, permit me then to address you on the subject of. And then that was the next heading. Oh, I mean one more. Let us be careful not to be drawn away from the manner and object of Christ's coming, for the next attack of the adversary will be to induce unbelief respecting these, the manner and the object. That's what he said. Okay. Um, whenever there's been a revival, the devil always attacks. We're told that whenever the genuine Holy Spirit is at work, there is always a counterfeit. And the devil does all types of attacks. And he felt impressed that these would be two areas specifically. As indeed the living temple is. Yes. Yes. The next line, which um, I can see I made a mistake on here, because it's not, again, the letter. This is actually, um, should be, the title in that line should be for October the 6th, the date in which... Um, he came to accept what is called the midnight cry. So you might want to write that in there. Only in October? Yes. What should we write on that line? Uh, Miller accepts, accepts the midnight cry, accepts the dates related, accepts the date of the midnight cry. Let's put that. Um, not in July, not in August. No. No, it was just weeks before the date he accepted it. And what was that date? October 22. October 22. Um, we'll look in the next overview, that of Joseph Bates, a little bit more about what happened the summer of, of 44 that introduced the midnight cry. Uh, but just briefly, uh, it began in August. And it began with a study of Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, because that's where the midnight cry comes from, that parable. And it specifically uh, pointed to October 22, as the following paragraph states. For a few months previous to this time, the attention of some had been directed to the tenth day of the seventh month of the current Jewish year. Again, that's the day of the Day of Atonement, tenth day of the seventh month. As the probable termination of several prophetic periods. And we'll, we'll highlight those a little bit more, as I said, in the next, uh, next overview of, of Bates' life. This was not generally received with favor by those who sympathized with Mr. Miller till a few weeks previous to the time designated, 
which on that year, following the reckoning of the Karaite Jews, fell on the 22nd day of October. The Karaite Jews, again, were a... These people were not superficial students. Okay? They realized that the Karaite Jews, they realized that the, the Jews, by and large, had left the biblical reckoning of the, of, the, of the year. And they had gone to some astronomical determinations of when the year began, because most Jews were no longer in Palestine to see when the barley harvest was ripe. And they said, we don't have to, we don't want to be tied to that anymore. So they left the scripture instruction as to the reckoning, and adopted some human tradition. Okay? But there was a group. They studied and they studied and they found there was a group that's still doing it. And they were called the Karaite Jews. And they still base their reckoning on what's happening in, in Palestine, in Jerusalem. And they found from that group of Jews when the, when the, when the tenth day of the seventh month would be that year. Because the barley harvest had already happened, right? Spring of that year. <laughs> and they said, this year's going to be October 22. So that's why they picked that date. Because a lot of people will try to, to reject the, the October 22 date because they say, look at, the, look at the evidence. It wasn't even on October 22. That was the, the Jews who had left the biblical tradition. They went back to those who held the scripture as their guide. Yes? So is the calendar date nowadays for Yom Kippur, is it on the Day of Atonement? Is it the that's a good question. To the Karyat Jews or... <laughs> Probably astronomical. Really? Yes, I, I, I would think so. I think the Karaites no longer exist. Uh, whether there is a group of Jews that are still looking at the barley harvest in Palestine and basing the, the reckoning of that year on would be a good question. I'm not familiar with the answer to that. It would be. So God kept these people going until the time came. At least he had a group at that time that were knowing how to do that. Whether or not they'd been going on all along, but... The, I forget the story on the Karaites as to where they got their name. I think I read something about that at one point. So continuing, Mr. Miller had a year and a half previous called attention to the seventh month as an important one in the Jewish dispensation. But as late as the date of his last letter, September 30, he had discountenanced the positiveness with which some were regarding it. On the 6th of October, he was first led to favor the expectation which pointed to that month, and thus wrote, If Christ does not come within 20 or 25 days, I shall feel twice the disappointment I did in the spring. Hmm. And of course, I didn't put it in here, <laughs> but that came, and he felt double disappointment. Not just again, but it meant, I think, twice as much. This is how I read this, yes. August 44. The Feast of Trumpets was the festival, bef the fall festival before. It was on. It was on the first day of the seventh month, which would be ten days before. All right. Um, there are various ways of looking at that. Usually, some people say it referred prophetically to the ten-year period before forty-four, in which the movement really well, expanded. Okay. So I've not heard anyone tie it to August of that year, because that would be a little more difficult, because you're getting them down to a very short period of time. And how well, does that Right. right. It was preached. Yeah. The warning was given yeah. To you could, you could say from 33 to 43. He got his license in 33 to right. preach, right? Exactly. <laughs> so that's, you know, that, that seems to be what that's looking at there. So the, the disappointment came again uh, to them, and um, he bore it with all the others. Um, he did not accept the sanctuary truth, which was the explanation of the disappointment that a handful of Adventists accepted, which 
became the Seventh-day Adventist out of this movement. Um, and he was influenced by his close associates not to accept that sanctuary explanation of it. No one says something about him. Right. And she said that they bear the main responsibility for his not accepting that, that additional light from the most holy place. Um, but before we close on Miller, I'd like just to describe um, how, read a description of how, what a man he was. We mentioned, we mentioned a little bit before how he was humble and, and courteous and sensitive apparently. But this is actually a first-hand account of his personal appearance. There is a kindness of soul, simplicity, and power, peculiarly original, combined in his manner. And he is affable and attentive to all without any affectation of superiority. He is of about medium stature, a little corpulent, which is the old word for overweight, overweight <laughs> and in temperament a mixture of sanguine and nervous. Uh, Sanguine means somebody who is very outgoing and, and uh, you know, gregarious. The life of the party. The life of the party, yeah. Melancholy. Melancholy. His intellectual developments are unusually full, and we see in his head great benevolence and firmness united with a lack of self-esteem. Very interesting account, huh? They're also in his memoirs. That, that is Sorry, that record. Could you read the first, the, the, just the very beginning of that, its first characteristics? The there is a kindness of soul, simplicity, and power, peculiar, peculiarly, I have a problem with that word, original, peculiarly original, combined in his manner, and then. The rest of the sentence says, and he is affable and attentive to all without any affectation of superiority. So, again... Is the story there about when he had uh, one invitation and he went, I forget what the transportation was, when he got there, the man that came to get him, mm -hmm. that was the pastor of the church, mm -hmm. looked at Miller and he was so ragged looking and everything that he couldn't believe it. He invited his old farmer to speak, and he takes him into the church. Is the story there? No. And uh, he just took him on the platform and sat him down, and he sat down in the audience. Mm -hmm. After Miller started speaking, and he saw, you know, how powerful he was, and all of this with him, he went back up and sat behind him on the platform. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in those days, you if you if you were uh, support wanting to show support of the speaker, you sat you stayed with him on the platform. In this, this, so yeah, this inviting minister again, just for the for the recording. It's like the inviting minister when he picked him up, wherever he was arriving in town, was so embarrassed by his 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 farmer look, perhaps we could say, that he took him to church but didn't sit on the platform with him until he started talking, and then as he heard him present in the in the power of his presentation, he went and sat, sat, sat with him on the platform. So again, um, just to make the point, um, we perhaps can learn from this humble farmer the type of person that God can use. Um, and I'm reminded of uh, a gentleman who speaks about there's been three great movements in time to which God has given this, the, the root of truth, as he called it. Which, which he referenced as the sanctuary message. One was to an Iraqi shepherd by the name of Abram, became Abraham, and his descendants, his, his movement, we could say. <laughs> the other was to a, a carpenter from Nazareth, and his movement. <laughs> and then there was a farmer from New York, and the movement that, that began with, with his ministry. Um, interesting way of looking at it because they all were given the sanctuary message in a very profound way uh, even though Miller himself never accepted it and ran with it we see that some five years after the uh, disappointment he passed away at a fairly young age of 67 and um, 
there's a very touching account of, of those last uh, days of his life as well. He died in, in the faith of the Second Advent. So I think it would be useful to uh, reflect on his life more if you have a chance. You get the memoirs, get the CD, uh, study about how God used this man. Amazing amount of material that he's written. If you want to um, just have a, have a feel for some of the things that he did in terms of his writings, I can read from you here just a few titles from his collection. By the way, there should be one that you should easily be able to access, even if you don't have the CD. If you have the book Early Writings, there's a, there's a chapter in Early Writings by William Miller. Are you aware of that? Some of you are, some of you aren't. Okay. It's, an, it's entitled Brother Miller's Dream. And it's an amazing account. And you can, James White actually produced a little booklet or pamphlet on this and gave him the interpretations as he understood of the dream. It's under James White's collection if you want to look at that. Yes, the, the uh, casket or the, the treasure chest with jewels and coins and then a uh, very, very interesting dream. Um, the dissertation, he gave, he gave one, uh, wrote one dissertation on the true inheritance of saints. Evidence from scripture and history of the second coming of Christ about the year 1843 really? and his personal reign of a thousand years. These are the titles of Miller's books I'm reading. Yeah. The Kingdom of God, a lecture on the typical Sabbaths and great jubilee. Letter to Joshua V. Himes on the cleansing of the sanctuary. Miller's reply to Stuart, hints on the interpretation of prophecy. Stuart's uh, hints on the interpretation of prophecy. A lot of what they were doing back then were answering their opponents. People that were attacking the message of the Advent. And I think they covered every argument that would ever be. And most of the things that people still throw out today, attacking Adventism, they've already answered it. Antiochus Epiphanes, they, they cover it and they ridicule it showing how totally unreasonable it is to consider he is the little horn there in Daniel 8. And then there's, th there's three volumes of his works. The one, first one is Views of Prophecies and Prophetic Chronology. The second one is entitled Evidences from Scripture and History of the Second Coming of Christ about the year 1843, similar to the previous title. And then Exposition on the 24th of Matthew, The True Inheritance of the Saints, The Cleansing of the Sanctuary, The Typical Sabbath, and a Review of Dimmick. Demic was another one of their opponents, as I recall. Remarks on Revelation, Revelations 13, 17, and 18. He's covering those chapters in Revelation. A review of a discourse delivered in the North Church, Newbury Port, on the last evening of the year 1841 by Demic. That's, again, the same man, Demic. And then William Miller's Apology in Defense. Something entitled that. So that's the collection of his works that are on the CD-ROM. Yes. Talking about opponents and answering the opposition. Yes. You may know, but some may, may not know. Audioverse recently uh, brought, is broadcasting this interview made in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, they were interviewing the secretary of Ken Wright. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah. It, the quality is not the best because mm -hmm. it comes from a from a old, set, old recording. Yeah. But you can have, you can hear this interview, and she relates the character and the personality mm -hmm. and his mannerisms, mm -hmm. he, the words when mm -hmm. he would attack Ellen mm -hmm. White, how he would become like possessed. Wow. And it's it sheds a lot of light. Yeah. Again, for the recording on Audioverse, there is a interview of D. M. Canwright's secretary. D. M. Canwright was a prominent Adventist minister who later left the church and wrote books attacking the church in Ellen White. And uh, his secretary was the one who was interviewed, um, telling, again, what type of man he was in evidences that, obviously, he was not under the Holy Spirit's guidance in what he was doing there. Um, yeah, we can learn a lot from that history as well, because they did have people that actually were part of them and left them and turned around and attacked them. And we're having that still today. So there are very, some very prominent ministries uh, um, that exist today. Uh, Life Assurance Ministry is one of them. That ex adventists that are attacking Adventists and trying to get people to uh, like turn against them. The That's right. 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 Okay. Um, any other thoughts on William Miller before we move on? I'd like to do two tonight if we can do, get it done. Sure. Thank you. 
Any other? We'll just sort of break here because we can make this into two parts. <laughs> Miller? Yes. Yes. We have one more. Joseph Bates. She was a special lady. She recognized Yeah. And yeah. to keep the Yeah. I encourage you to download this issue. There's an, there's an article here on Lucy, Mrs. William Miller, the Forgotten Pioneer. There's an article on that, on her there. Very short one. It's two paragraphs. <laughs> Francis Foster did it. But again, um, a little bit about her. Why did he die so Um. I don't remember the, the the disease or the diagnosis if they had that back then. I think he probably had some form of uh, high blood pressure, heart disease that caused him to sure. to go into failure. But he was, was it influenced by the disappointment? Was it kind of hastened? I don't recall that there was any evidence that it was hastened by that experience. Do you recall anything, Colleen, on that? He wasn't feeling good on October 22, 1844. Uh -huh. He had suffered from poor health. They didn't, they didn't have the health message then. <laughs> uh, again, in the history of Adventism, all of them at one point, all of the people who began to believe in the seventh day, as well as the Advent, all of the Seventh-day Adventist ministers were totally incapacitated because of poor health. Yeah. They didn't understand the proper ways of eating. Back then. Yeah. But his life might have been prolonged if mm -hmm. he had Right. Right. It's like Paul. Mm -hmm. I think he was short because he was starting influenced. to his own ways. Yeah. Well, and also Paul was influenced by his his brethren to go to do this thing at the temple, which we're told was not. And Miller likewise influenced by his brethren too. We have a hard time staying out of the ditch of I'm independent. I don't have to listen to anybody. And then we listen to our friends too much, you know, and we don't stay tuned with God. So, yeah, the Lord, Lord understands. Hear the right voice. Right. The Lord understands, and He doesn't, uh, He may not be able to use us as much, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, and he, we're lost. He will be in heaven. Ellen White says the angels are guarding His dust. Right. Right. They're still guarding His dust. Why would they stop? You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the cemetery is right beside where his mother lived. Okay. Where his grave is. Yeah, where his grave is. Yeah. How does she say, what's the same thing? She says, angels guard her. Do you want me to look it up? I think the angels guard his holy dust to come. And then yeah. she also says, his refusal to see some of these things would not be laid to his charge. Right. Right. Early writings, page 258, paragraph 2. God suffered him, speaking of William Miller, this is page 258, paragraph 2, early writings. God suffered him, Miller, to fall under the power of Satan, the dominion of death, and hid him in the grave from those who were constantly drawing him from the truth. And for, drawing him from the truth in that context means the light of the third angel message, third angel's message. Moses erred as he was about to enter the promised land. So also I saw that William Miller erred as he was soon to enter the heavenly Canaan in suffering his influence to go against the truth. Others led him to this. Others must account for it. But angels watch the precious, precious dust of this servant of God and he will come forth at the sound of the last trump. That's the statement there about him.